Today I'm joined by Victor Ferraro Espanza. Uh, Victor is the strategic product manager, 5G Core in Solution Area Packet Core within Ericsson Digital Services. Victor, great to see you. Thanks so much for making time to catch up with me. Thank you very much. Now, this is the second in this Spotlight series. In our first interview, we had uh, Anders uh, Lundstrom uh, explain the key aspects of 5G technology, and in particular, what the new 5G Core is and why it's so important. Today, I was hoping we could talk more about why it's so important, uh, that is the 5G Core, uh, in particular, at unleashing the full potential of 5G. So I wonder, Victor, if you could maybe just explain as a, at a high level why evolving to the 5G Core is so important to service providers. Yeah, indeed. I think that the why question is very important. And I would say that there are uh, three main reasons. Uh, number one, it's about getting flexibility and speed for new business opportunities. And then in the 5G core, we have, and we, we have a specific capabilities and functions that are actually defined to support that. Uh, and maybe uh, we can look at the exposure area or the network slicing, for example. Then the, uh, the second thing, it's about uh, a high, high, highly efficient systems operations. And this is very important because if we move to new business opportunities, that means two things. It basically means more traffic, and also means complexity. So it's important to be able to catch up on, on these two parts and have efficient use of resources, the hardware resources, have high, high capacity. And also the way that the applications are built are important with, uh, for example, cloud native technology to support you know, uh, the possibility to uh, introduce all these uh, new business in a good, smooth way with low OPEX on that one. And then, of course, the uh, automation, high degrees of automation is important, even with closed loops to, let's say, get analytics and retune the network based on the information that the network is providing. And then the, the first thing why this is uh, important in evolution to 5G core is that we are sitting on top of a, a very powerful radio access. We have 5G uh, service characteristics on the radio. They are, uh, I mean, if you take, for example, the standalone radio, we get figures like six, six times uh, uh, faster access to content. So you can move from inactive to a connected state six times faster than, than we do it in LTE or what in non-standalone. Then uh, you can achieve the high throughput also much faster, uh, like five times much faster than in previous technologies. So at the end of the day, the 5G core cannot be the bottleneck for all these uh, characteristics. So it's important that we have a design and we have features like, for example, edge computing uh, that can help uh, and can achieve all these characteristics in a good way. But this is not the, uh, I mean, all this is not going to, let's say, land from the, uh, to the earth from the sky. I mean, we have 4G there. Uh, 4G, it's, it's going to be, uh, I mean, there's a lot of traffic, a lot of users still in 4G. So what we really see, it's a need to have a core solution where we can manage at the same time 4G and 5G and enable all these values that I, I said before also for 4G uh, and have a good evolution into into the 5G core system. I wonder if you could sort of elaborate a little more on just how uh, uh, that should be achieved. How, how, how should folk go about that gravel, gra I keep tripping myself up, gradual evolution to 5G? Okay, I think that the uh, here there are I mean, it's definitely the main business problem that the uh, service providers are facing, how to evolve into a 5G core in a good way. Uh, the evolution has to be smooth. I mean, it has to be an evolution where the services are not disrupted for existing, uh, let's say, consumers. But it has to be an evolution where you can incorporate, uh, you know, the new capabilities in a good way. So there are different strategies. So you can start more from, let's say, uh, moving from the uh, non-standalone and take the next steps, deploying standalone on the 5G core and extend the coverage to support, let's say, mobile broadband services, voice services, and start uh, getting the big, the gains of this uh, high automation, this uh, high system efficiencies uh, for operations coming from the 5G core, lowering your OPEX, that's one way. Then uh, there are features to basically uh, do a tight interworking between the 5G core and the APC domain, so we can guarantee all, all the service aspects in a good way. Another way would be a star more from a greenfield approach. 
So trying to explore these new business opportunities to industry segments and uh, get the core and the standalone radio, play with it, understand the technology, understand all the values that can be uh, uh, explained to, uh, to industries, and at some point of time, decide how to merge that with the, uh, let's say, the main track. At the end of the day, uh, all the, uh, let's say, all the paths, they lead to the same goal, which is having a core solution, which can support the growth that you have in 4G and 5G, that can support all these new business opportunities where we can incorporate network slicing in a smooth way and edge computing. And this is the end goal that we see uh, with high levels of orchestration and automation on top of that to be able to manage all this complexity. So different ways to start, but common goals or common, uh, let's say, uh, end end goals. One thing that comes to mind is that the 5G core introduces a whole new architecture to the core of service providers' networks. Um, I wonder if you can sort of elaborate on how this new architecture will help them achieve more agility and operational efficiency in particular. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Um, I think that here there are two, two aspects to highlight. One is the, uh, the service-based architecture, and the second thing is the cloud-native uh, technology that we are using to, to build the 5G core. So if we start with the first, service-based architecture, what is that? So it's basically it's a flat architecture. You have network functions. They can behave as either consumers or producers or both. Uh, and the good thing is that all the network functions in, in this architecture, they speak the same language, right? It's HTTP, web-based. And there are two main grammar rules that everybody uh, understands in this language. It's the basically, uh, request, response, and subscribe, notify. So from that perspective, it's much easier to, let's say, interconnect network functions, to test them, to do, uh, you know, to trace errors, to monitor how things happen there. And then there is another important thing in the service-based architecture is there's a function called NRF, Network Repository Function. This is like the, uh, the place where all the, uh, the network functions register who they are what services they provide. And this function also, what does is to inform the rest of the network functions that, hello, I got a new one in the architecture. So those are the services available. This is the slice where this function exists. And this is the, uh, for example, the users that this function is gonna cover. So you can make use of it. So from network function deployment point of view, things are automated uh, from day one. So. If you, for example, compare uh, with a point-to-point -point architecture, the legacy architecture we have today in an EPC network, when you want to, to bring an in-network function, you need to do a multi-protocol integration, right? Different languages, you need to integrate uh, different endpoints. Here is like straightforward integration, automated, and with that, we can save up to 75% of network integration activity. So it's a huge step uh, into, in that direction. Then the second aspect is the cloud native technology. And this is very simple. This is the, uh, the network functions are decomposed in a smaller pieces, software units called microservices. These microservices uh, can even be reduced. So they are not, let's say, uh, only for a specific network function. They can be shared by different network functions. So it increased efficiency as well. And the, uh, they are running on top of a, a container. They are deployed as a containers on top of a container platform. And this platform takes all the, uh, let's say, uh, full automation of how to interconnect microservices, how to scale them, how to upgrade them. And the f interesting thing here is this happens in a, in a time scale of seconds. So if we compare regular, let's say, operations that we have in, in existing networks, uh, BM-based uh, products or physical products, then you suddenly move from a time scale of hours and uh, into a time scale of seconds. And this is really changing the uh, completely the paradigm for, for operations. So it means that we can do upgrades much faster, uh, taking a smaller pieces, just the ones that we need to support specific requirements, or we can uh, basically you know, tailor the uh, the software build to a specific business needs in a in a very uh, 
you know, optimized way. So it's really a new, uh, completely new uh, paradigm for operations, what we are seeing. It is an exciting time for the telco and carrier uh, service provider industry space. I think a lot of the things that we're talking about here when you talk about cloud native, things being uh, refactored, all the code refactored to be cloud native and containerized in the likes of Docker and running under Kubernetes and under environments like OpenStack or others, uh, and, and essentially moving to a software-defined infrastructure and software-defined networking world and network function virtualization. We're sort of moving to that API economy that we've enjoyed in the enterprise world where we don't necessarily have to have so many nines now that we can do uh-huh. this uh, in a software defined world in the telco space, as you said, being able to build new services and, and apply them to a service catalog that people can draw on to build new capabilities for consumer products uh, is, is going to do two things in my mind. It's going to dramatically reduce the time to market, but also to reduce the time to return on investment. You, you mentioned a number of things. I wonder if we can just elaborate a little further on. Um, I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit further on the different network capabilities that can be improved in the 5G core when it's compared to the likes of 4G. Okay, uh, that's a good one. So, I mean, there are, there's one capability which is at the top of the list. Uh, everybody talks about it. It's uh, end-to-end network slicing, right? This is, uh, it's important to highlight that this is end-to-end. What does end-to-end mean is basically uh, we have identifiers that are shared between from terminals, radio access, core network, right? They are understood. But everybody, we register them in the NRF. Each network function in the core knows in which slice they are sitting on. And this is very important to settle service level agreements and to create virtual networks with the right characteristics that we talked before. I mean, if we look at performance or throughput latencies or quality of service or security levels or even charging that we want to, to apply to a specific uh, network slice. So, I think that this is a very important capability, which is pretty much enhanced and is key to support all the uh, all the possibilities with the of the five core. Second one is edge computing. I think that this is the uh, as we said before, if we want to keep throughputs and latency levels, we need to break out the traffic whenever needed, so close to the source or depending on different uh, needs. And it's not only that the uh, possibility to distribute the user plane to the, in the right place, it's also all the logic that you put on top of that to control who access to that uh, user plane with APIs, exposure APIs, and also with uh, you know data management and policy management systems providing information to the control plane to be able to basically assign users into the right, uh, uh, let's say, edge of the network. Then uh, a third one. Uh, which is also important and it's pretty much enhanced is the uh, exposure area. We have a network function called a network exposure function. This basically can create uh, an extra view of the uh, capabilities from the core and it can, do, it can do it much faster way than ever because everything is web-based from southbound and northbound. So it's really a, a very fast way to create a you know, new set of APIs that can act uh, over the different uh, network functions. We see things like uh, background data transfer, event monitoring, or for example, APIs that are touching this part of application influence on traffic routing, for example, to control the edge. I love the way you've outlined that with regard to highlighting that there are other spaces that uh, service providers and telcos and enterprise users can consume. I think there's been this uh, misunderstanding that 5G is just another G and that when we went from 2 to 3G, we sort of moved into a more digital network than 3 to 4. We, we, we had things where voice wasn't just the killer app anymore. You could sort of, you know, receive emails and listen to music and maybe stream a little bit of video. But I think there was still a, a, a lot of misunderstanding around the transition to 5G, still just being another sort of handset-based voice and data type network. But what you've really outlined there for me and for our viewers, I think, is that we need to think about 5G now as a whole new complex ecosystem, a very powerful, flexible, dynamic, agile ecosystem where uh, it's not just another G, voice isn't the only killer app. And as you said, you know, you can have technologies like the inter- you know, Internet of Things and sensors or in the industrial Internet of Things and manufacturing plants or robot- robots running around places, retail using uh, uh, intelligent warehousing, autonomous vehicles. And, and that really low latency, high throughput, high bandwidth, uh, making those things possible. 
uh, I think you know just people can now start to think much more broadly about what they can do with it, and, and particularly even the transition from using Wi-Fi sort of 802.11x connectivity, where we're restricted to a couple of hundred devices, where with 5G access points we can potentially connect millions, uh, and where network slicing makes that possible for different types of quality of services and and level of service. I think there's just so much potential there now that it's almost one of these things where it's breathtakingly exciting. I wonder, as, as a last question, if I could, um, one of the things that keeps coming up, uh, whether it's in boardrooms or, or in discussions and panels and events, the entire broad spectrum of conversation around 5G core is this whole question of, you know, does 5G core really introduce a future-proof network architecture? I wonder if you could sort of elaborate a little on that and, and sort of touch on some of those points. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think that this is the uh, the future future-proof architecture for to, to move into these all these new business opportunities. And if we take, for example, 3EPP, the standards, uh, and if we look at the uh, release system standardization, so we see uh, very minor additions for the EPS system and a lot of work items defined for the 5G core system. So this just tells you the level of magnitude of, of focus and the shift of the focus from from EPS into the 5G core system when it comes to, to standardization. If we, if we look further into release 17, then uh, basically you cannot find at all any EPC related items. So it's all focused on, on the 5G core system and all features and capabilities that are needed to support what we just talked to in the, uh, to the, this interview. Well, Victor, thank you so much for your time. It's been great to see you. I'm glad to hear that you're well and, and uh, you and your family are doing well through this challenging period. And uh, I really appreciate the amazing insights you've shared there and certainly the outline of some of these key questions that are coming up regularly around not just 5G, but the 5G core and all things around that. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in person soon and get you on camera, but in, in real life. Sure. Thank you very much. Appreciate, appreciate it. You have, a, you have a great day and stay safe and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.